my previous lecture that I give I gave lecture to the student in the University of Hawaii at Manoa and in the Dr. Kevin Nut class and Professor Kevin Nut PhD uh, he he is assistant professor in the University of Hawaii at Manoa and he he obtained uh, his PhD from University of Cambridge and then Bachelor of Architecture from University of Nottingham, Bachelors of Arts, Architecture and Environmental Design from University of Nottingham. He have uh, many professional experience in teaching from different university, from University of Oregon, University of Queensland, Australia, University of Tasmania, uh, Mururan Institute of Technology, University of Tokyo. So I cannot mention one by one. So he has a lot of experience <laughs> in doing interna international class. And we are lucky to have him today. And uh, he will deliver uh, lectures in relation to uh, international architecture. Yeah. Uh, I'm not very sure about uh, what the specific topic he will deliver for us today, but I'm sure that will be very interesting to us to uh, to uh, to look at uh, Dr. Kevin Nut presentation. Okay, uh, Kevin, the yeah. time is yours. Okay, Thank do you have you something guys. to share for presentation? Uh, I I do, absolutely, yeah. Um, uh, hope you can see that. Um, okay. And and for the student, if you have uh, questions, you can you can ask in Bahasa Indonesia after this, or in English. Yeah. So don't worry about the language. Yeah. Okay. Continue, Kevin. Yes, Camus. Camus. Before I begin, I wanted to offer you the same uh, uh, facility that you gave us. Uh, you kindly agreed to allow me to record your your talk, so it's fine if you wish to record this. Uh, uh, yeah, could, um, I'm sorry. Uh, is it okay if I if we're recording your? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, recorded you, so uh, just in case you want to record this, then. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Go back and listen. Um, I'm not hearing the, the recording sound, but uh, uh, I'm going to assume that. Uh, do you do you have uh, uh, the recording on, Kenneth? Yeah, it's it's already on. The recording is on. Oh, okay. I I usually hear a. Uh, uh, but we cannot hear the voice from the. Ah, okay. Um, the film. So I'm going to go back. Uh, whoops. Okay, let me let me begin from from scratch. Uh, this 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 talk this um, presentation is based on some research that uh, started. Uh, quite a long time ago and was finally published uh, about two years ago. Um, and uh, as, as the subtitle explains, it's to do with something that is common to all of us in the world. Uh, we have slightly different local weathers, but we share clearly one global atmosphere. Um, so this, this is a topic I, th I felt would be appropriate anywhere, basically. Um, uh, the clouds uh, that I'm seeing now at some point were over your part of the world, probably, and later on they'll be over I don't know where. But um, so this is about the local and the, and the global, uh, and in particular, uh, a global problem, challenge that we all face, uh, global warming, um, and what we can do about that. Um, so the work has two primary objectives. One is to improve the 
the health and the well-being of people inside buildings. Uh, the other one is, is equally, if not more important, which is to make uh, sustainable design practices in, in buildings more visible to building occupants. And I'll go into those arguments uh, in, in more detail, obviously, but those are the two primary roles. Gradually over the years, uh, the priority has shifted from making conditions inside buildings nicer for people um, to the sustainable strategies, uh, because we are now, uh, I'm sure you know, in, in an absolute crisis in terms of we're at a turning point. Um, we probably have, if we're lucky, 10 years before it's too late to do something about climate change. So, um, so this is an effort, limited, um, but an effort to explore what can architects do um, in terms of not so much what we build and how much energy we save, but mainly about how we can teach. And you may say, well, I'm not a teacher, but um, design and buildings are you know, the, the design of buildings and is a, is a wonderful opportunity to teach. And it's an unused, completely untapped opportunity usually to teach about sustainability. Um, and uh, that's probably my main message that uh, one building may not save very much energy. It's like a drop in the ocean, but, um, but who knows how many people will experience that building, especially uh, with the internet. Um, so buildings can have a disproportionate educational effect, um, stimulating effect. Um, and that didn't used to be the case, but with the advent of the internet and other kinds of social media, um, it's possible for one or two buildings to have a huge impact, much more than they would have before. So that's really the primary message of, of, this, of this research and this presentation. So uh, I'm not sure about the rest of you, but I find it very difficult to watch this kind of um, scene, this kind of documentary that, um, you know, yet another awful consequence of global warming, you know, starving, drowning, polar bears, and all the other terrible things that we see. And uh, I'm probably not the only one who is kind of aware of this, but feels helpless that I'm not able to do anything about it. How am I going to save this polar bear right? and, or do anything about it? So um, rather than dwell on the negative, which are terrible and other people better equipped uh, are obviously working on that, I hope. Uh, I want to focus on what we as architects and you as the future uh, designers of the built environment could do. So my main complaint, I suppose, is that this is about as much as most countries do in terms of educating the public about sustainability. Um, and even architects would not be able to understand why this building got its lead award. Now, there's an equivalent in every country. I'm sure there's one in Indonesia. In the US, it happens to be lead. But I'm sure it's the same situation that even architects cannot tell, apart from noticing perhaps this plaque in the lobby of the building, um, they would have no idea why that building received that award. So you can only imagine that the general public is even more in the dark. They have no clue, right? They wouldn't even notice this plaque and they certainly wouldn't notice because most sustainable buildings look exactly like non-sustainable buildings, even to us, let alone to members of the public. And this is a huge missed opportunity in my opinion that um, sustainability and the sustainability of uh, sustainable design of buildings then needs to be more visible. And this research really looks at how that could be made the case, how to make sustainable practices visible to building occupants and the general public in, um, or the public in general, with the hope that that will stimulate them to be interested and to talk to the people who own their building or change their building. But just a few architects in a few buildings designed to lead platinum is not going to have any significant effect on 
from the problems we, we face. Uh, this is a global problem and it's going to require uh, acts by large proportions of the population, in addition to lots of other things, if we're going to turn this around. So it's time that our buildings began to talk, began to talk to not just other architects, but to the general public, to the people who occupy and see those buildings. So that's what this, this research is really about. So something you're probably aware of, um, maybe not, um, a survey by the US uh, Environmental um, no, the Protection Agency, yes, the EPA, maybe 15 years ago or more, concluded that uh, in the United States, uh, most people spend over 90% of their lives indoors. And uh, that is almost certainly higher today and not just because of COVID. Um, so with your generation, I hope you will all live into your 90s or more or further. Um, that amounts to more than 70 years of your life will be spent inside buildings. The vast majority of your life will be spent indoors. Um, so that environment, that internal environment ought to really matter. And of course it does to architects, but it, it matters to everybody, even though a lot of people are not aware of it. So um, another thing that they're not aware of is that during that 70 years in, indoors, uh, most existing indoor spaces deprive us, the general public, of two critical human needs, uh, contact with nature and perceptible change. And contact with nature is something that um, is ought to be self-evident, that given an opportunity, most of us try to get out into nature at the weekend we go to the beach or we go to the forest or wherever it might be we go to the park whatever is available but there's a very deep bond there with nature not surprisingly because our early ancestors evolved mostly outdoors and surrounded by nature um, and this is now part of our dna you know, we need uh, um, indeed our part of nature and that's you know, the illusion that we're separate from nature is one of the problems that's got us into this situation, that, that somehow we can um, thrive while nature suffers. Yeah. We're completely interdependent. If nature suffers, we're going to suffer, finally. So, um, and we're beginning to find that out now, of course. Um, but um, not only were our early ancestors surrounded by nature, but they were surrounded by change. Um, if you go outside or even just look outside, you will notice that, that nature is, is full of change. Look at the sky. It's never the same from moment to moment. Look at the ocean. Uh, um, usually the wind is blowing, the, the clouds are moving, something's changing. Uh, and um, so there are two important consequences then. Um, contact with nature is known to um, calm us. Um, and without contact with nature, um, there tends to be an increase in, in chronic stress. Right? We go to the park, we go to the beach, we go to the forest to calm us. Right? It's kind of self-medication. Um, without that, it, for 70 years, right, for 90% of our lives, we're in environments that have very little or no nature. Um, and also, just to make it worse, no perceptible change. And, um, and we are still genetically 99.9% .9 or more, just like our early ancestors, that we need contact with nature and we physiologically need perceptible change in our environments. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, I'm sure your computer, like mine, in order to save the battery life, um, if you don't touch it for 30 minutes or so, um, the screen saver will come on. And if you don't touch it for a couple of hours, maybe it'll turn itself off. Right. Well, the human brain is exactly the same. Um, so when put in a situation where it's understimulated, it slowly, um, first of all, we daydream, and then eventually we'll, we'll switch off, we'll go to sleep. Um, and, and that's not good if you're trying to get something done. Right? And, and most indoor environments subject us to that kind of static environment, um, which is a form of low level, but persistent 
sensory deprivation. And sensory deprivation has long been a form of torture, right? Where you put somebody in a cell and they don't know if it's night or day and there's no stimulation. And not knowingly, but buildings basically subject building occupants to a very low level of that for 90% of people's lives, right? which is pretty shocking. Right? So there are two things missing, nature and perceptible change from most indoor environments. And that's not good when we spend 90% of our lives in those environments, but our physiology is still the same as our ancestors and we need nature and we need change. We need nature to keep us calm and we need change to keep us stimulated, to keep us alert. So there's a buildup of stress and there's also a, a, a lowering of attention, of alertness in static environments. So we're, we're more stressed than we need to be and we're not as alert as we could be in many of the indoor spaces that we spend most of our lives in. Okay. So there's a potential source of both nature and change. Um, the good news is uh, just a few millimeters away from most of us when we're indoors. Most, not all, but most indoor environments have a window of some kind um, with a few millimeters of glass. And on the other side of that glass is the biggest global wilderness uh, in the world, you know, uh, the atmosphere, the one that we all share. Far bigger than the Amazon or, or any other sort of green uh, wilderness. Our atmosphere is the biggest wilderness and it's much more wild, right? Um, you know, we can to some degree control the Amazon. We are in a very negative way now, right? You can cut down trees, you can do things, you know. Um, but the wilderness that is the, the atmosphere is basically beyond our control, as is, we're showing now. We have storms, we have typhoons, uh, you know, uh, we cannot control that atmosphere. Um, um, so obviously that is the atmosphere is both natural and it is perpetually changing. Right? It's never the same um, from moment to moment, nor from place to place. And, and yet it's only a few millimeters away. In other words, the solution or one potential solution to the problem of a lack of nature and a lack of perceptible change in indoor environments, the solution is just a few millimeters away on the other side of that piece of glass. Now the question becomes, and you've probably already been through this, um, you know, in most schools of architecture, the first thing you're taught is that the weather is the enemy, right? The other, the weather is the thing that buildings are supposed to shelter us from, which is true, right? Um, I enjoy being um, dry and, and not overheated or too cold, just like anybody else. Um, but what seems to have happened is that in the process of keeping the weather out, we've also thrown out contact with nature and perceptible change. So this research has been looking at recalibrating the envelope of buildings with a view to allowing the movement of the weather, that kind of perceptible change, um, and an awareness of that natural movement back into buildings, but without actually undermining the sheltering function of buildings, which is obviously important. So um, the weather is essentially, quintessentially, nothing but change, right? Uh, the sun appears to move, it's really us, of course. Um, the air is moving all the time, um, precipitation of varying kinds. Um, so the atmosphere is, is, is as natural as anything on the earth, probably more so, because we're unable to control it, thank goodness, um, and probably more changeable. In other words, it's the perfect solution to those two deficits. It is natural change. You know, that could be a, a synonym for the Earth's atmosphere. So how exactly, though, um, can one bring the movements of the weather indoors without compromising the primary role of most buildings, which is to shelter us from the sun, the wind, and the rain? Well, um, these are by no means the only ways, but uh, three ways of doing that would be one is enclosure, where I'm not sure if you can see this. Uh, it's pretty subtle, but uh, that bamboo is actually moving. Um, the air movement. So by enclosing a little piece of the outdoor environment within a building in a glazed courtyard, um, then 
we can create the sense that that movement is actually in the interior space with us. So enclosure, spatial enclosure, uh, especially tiny courtyards of this kind, um, can be an effective means of bringing that natural movement in without actually necessarily bringing in the wind. And if this is glazed, then it seems like it's part of the interior, even though the, the air is not continuing. Now, if it's warm weather, you can open that up and you can actually get the breeze in as well. And that's clearly, that was the intention in this particular Japanese uh, villa. Another way is uh, to project or to allow the sun to project. Um, and these are all wind animated, by the way, uh, just as an example. So first of all, you can see the wind animation of the bamboo. But in the second case, you see just the wind animation of the silhouettes, the shadows being cast. Um, but it very much is just as much part of the interior um, because it's on an interior wall as the, the first example. So projection, direct projection, usually by the sun. And the last would be back projection where um, you've all seen this, I'm sure. Uh, that tree is several yards away. I don't know how far away, but it's back projected silhouette on this paper um, uh, screen is really in the interior space with us. It's actually part of that surface. So it's effectively brought that change inside without the air movement or the tree. And translucent materials are basically um, the means of transmitting that or you, for back projection. So let's have a look at the three kind of suspects then. The first one is sunlight. And um, normally we don't see the movement of the sun in real time. The only time we would see it would be sunrise and sunset, where there is a datum, in this case the horizon. Okay. And we can actually measure that movement. Right? But normally it's such a slow movement that we are not aware of it. And that's probably a good thing. Right? In other words, the Earth moves. Um, in relation to the sun just slowly enough that it's, it's not fast enough for our perception of change to pick it up. The human eye can pick up about, um, the minimum speed that the human eye can pick up is about one millimeter per second. And, um, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. So here's an example of five hours of movement that has been compressed into nine seconds. So this is, you know, we're seeing basically five hours of the movement of the Earth. Um, now, in the previous slide of the sunset, we were actually seeing the rotation of the Earth in real time. And uh, that would be super cool if we could, if we could do that um, inside buildings, for example. Uh, but normally we can't. But there are ways to do so. OK, this is a kind of a joke uh, from The Simpsons. Um, so you know, they're using uh, a solar clock, basically, to measure when it's time to drink. Um, but uh, historically, um, one way of seeing um, that kind of movement of the Earth is to increase the projection distance. So if the projection distance from the object, in this case, there's a stone right behind us, and um, you know, Stonehenge, the end of this shadow, is more than um, 40 feet or 15 meters, 45 feet, 15 meters. Um, that's the magical distance. That is the distance at which uh, or over which you need to project the solar shadow or a patch of sunlight for it to be visible to the human eye. At that distance of projection, it will be moving at one millimeter per section uh, per, per second. And at that speed, it is visible in real time. Anything slower, any shorter projection distance, and it will not be visible. Now, you know, 15 meters is not small, but it, it's still within the order of magnitude that buildings can manage. Uh, here's a building in India um, from uh, 17th century, uh, 18th century, sorry. Um, and it's a, it's a solar uh, instrument. It's, it's a solar clock, basically. The shadow of the sun is being cast from this gnomon down onto this scale, which has um, gradations of, of time. And um, it 
amazingly to me, the projection distance um, is almost exactly 15 meters, which means that this shadow moves at almost exactly one millimeter per second, right at the lower threshold of human perception. And it's famous that if you stand as these people are near this shadow, you can actually see the movement. And this clock uh, is reputed to be able to tell the time to within about a second or two. And this, they must have done experiments and they must have figured out because it, it's beyond coincidence, surely, that they um, hit upon 15 meters, which is right at the threshold where we can see the movement. So you may be aware of this building. This is uh, Isozaki's Team Disney building in Florida, um, which has an unusual sundown, um, horizontal sundown. And um, uh, it's a little bit complex, not really, but uh, mathematics. But this is um, in order to generate a, a visibly moving shadow then um, the projection distance needs to be 12 over the cosine of the latitude. In other words, where you are on the Earth, your latitude, right, um, will affect the projection distance you need. But it, for example, in this case, um, uh, this shadow would absolutely be visible for these people. The movement of it is, is much faster than one millimeter per second. In fact, it could be half the, half the height and it would still be visible. So it's perfectly possible to cast shadows that are visible in real time, to be able for buildings to make the movement of the earth directly visible to people. Um, here's a couple of examples of how that might be done. We're, we're very used to seeing this kind of situation. Right? Um, we're less used to seeing this, where there's patches of sunlight rather than the inverse, which are just shadows. And, um, so if you have a choice, this is better because, first of all, we're not as used to seeing it, so we're going to pay more attention to it. But also, it's easier to see. There is less competing glare. You know, these bars are actually more visible than these because these light patches tend to interfere with our with our sight. So if you have a choice, um, using patches of sunlight is actually better than a, a patch of no sunlight or a shadow. Even better is not to have many, but to have one patch of sunlight. Um, in the case on the left, it's uh, Tadao Ando's Church of Light in Osaka. Um, and if you give that particular patch of light a very uh, familiar form, as in the uh, Pantheon here, or its cruciform, um, it makes it even more obvious when that uh, patch of light has moved, because we know what it's um, original form is, so we can tell when it's being distorted. We know how far away from it is ideal. And um, you may be surprised to learn um, that the Pantheon in Rome, uh, you should absolutely go and see that building. But when you go, don't do what everybody does and just look at the Oculus. Right? Try to go in the middle of the day and try to go in the middle of the summer, because if you do, especially if you went in midsummer, um, this patch of light, uh, trust me, is moving um, visibly. N notice none of the people here are looking down. They're all looking up or somewhere else, right? If they were looking down, they would be able to see this very obviously moving because it's distance from the oculus where the light is coming in. The projection distance is much more than 15 meters, right? So it's actually moving at, at about three times the perceptible speed, which is extraordinary. And, and it's one aspect of the Pantheon that I don't think any of the tour guides ever tell anybody. So nobody ever bothers to look at that. Now you can't see it a lot of the time. You have to be there in the middle of the day and probably in the middle of the summer. Right? But if you get a chance, um, that would be a great experience. Um, here is an example. And um, just so you know that this is actually a video, this is what one millimeter per second of movement um, looks like. It is very, very slow, almost imperceptible. But if you concentrate, if you focus on this edge of this solar spectrum, you should be able to just barely see it moving. It's already moved in the time that I've been talking. So this was filmed, um, and it just so happened um, 
it's about 14 or so uh, meters from the optical prism, a triangular prism is in the glass facade of this building, and the projection distance, as I say, is about 14 meters. So that is, and I've calculated this according to the size of the, uh, um, of the elevator doors, etc. That is what one millimeter per second looks like. So it's right at the limit. Right? Very hard to see, but you can just see it's definitely moved in the minute or so that I've been talking about. So it's possible to do this within a building. There are buildings that, that already do this. Um, this is a little bit harder to explain. Um, in a solar spectrum, of course, all the colors move together. But this is an instrument designed by Janet Saad Cook, who you could look up. It's called a, a sun drawing instrument. And light passes through this dichroic glass. The dichroic glass basically divides the glass into its different um, wavelengths, different colors, and then there it is distorted. It's an undulating surface. So they they get split, refracted differently, and then they are bounced back from another deformed mirror. And what the effect of that is, is that the different colors are divided, but they also move at different speeds and in different ways in relation to each other. So this becomes even more obvious over the space of an hour, unlike a solar spectrum that just shifts all together, these different colors are doing a kind of dance in relation to each other. I'm not sure if I, yeah, here we go. Here's an example. And this is what's happening, right? The, the light is coming through um, and some of it is coming back uh, along different path lengths. And it's being, uh, some of it is being directly um, reflected back, some of it is refracted, then reflected, and some of it is coming directly back from the mirror. And this is how the different colors actually move. Unlike a solar spectrum, they move relative to each other. You should, uh, if you get a chance, look up Janet Cook's uh, sun drawings. She has a website. So I, I'm fairly sure that you're unable to see this. What I can see on my screen are shadows of convection currents. Um, if you've ever, um, I'm trying to think of where, uh, where you, we see this very often in places, or I used to see this in places where there was a radiator or a heater. Right? Because I live in Hawaii, I don't see this very often, we don't eat. Um, uh, but um, basically, oh, here's another example. Then. These are visible signs of the heating effect of the sun. Uh, what's happening here is, um, there's some moisture on this roof. The roof is getting heated by the sun. That um, moisture is evaporating, but then it's cooling very quickly below its dew point. It's, it's a sunny, but rather cold day. Um, so what we're seeing is mist. Um, this is moisture that's been evaporated and then rapidly recondenses as mist just above the roof. So it looks like smoke, but it's actually mist. So there are ways to reveal something as invisible as the heat of the sun. Right? That radiant uh, heat can, and its effects anyway, can be made visible. Here's another example of um, this. This is a um, uh, a building in the mountains in Nagano in Japan, and this was filmed quite early in the morning. When I arrived, this reflecting pool was actually frozen. And what we're seeing is the sun rapidly heating the surface of this pond. And these are convection currents, right? Uh, when you have warm fluid and cold fluid mixing, you get these temperature gradients. And that is what's being reflected up onto the building. Now, I'm fairly sure that this was not the intention of the designer. But imagine if you designed it such that this was being deliberately projected inside. So we're seeing there not wind movement so much as um, temperature differences. So the effects of the sun, something that is normally invisible, right? You're not even, you're, you would not see this with the naked eye on the pond itself, but you see it up here because it's being magnified and projected. So just to sum up then on um, the sun, then uh, changes in position or the form of isolated um, 
solar shadows or patches of sunlight are, is one way of, of using the sun or our movement and the Earth's movement in relation to the sun to bring change, perceptible change to indoor spaces. You can also magnify these changes through long projection distances, more than 15 meters, and uh, that movement will become visible in real time, perceptible. You can also use reflection and refraction to make those movements even more noticeable. And then you can reveal the normally invisible heating effects of sunlight on air or liquids. Air, of course, is a fluid, um, and so is a liquid. But they both behave similarly. Um, and in particular, air, um, when it has uh, different densities, actually, uh, even though air is a an invisible fluid, when it has different temperatures and different uh, densities, uh, those convection currents will cast shadows, which is an extraordinary phenomenon that a, that a transparent fluid can actually cast shadows when it has a temperature gradient and convection currents in it. So on to the second suspect, the wind, um, which is you know the most available. Uh, there is air movement almost everywhere, almost all the time. It can be very gentle, um, but it's almost always there. The sun, obviously, half the time, we, we don't see the sun. And it doesn't, you know, rain is sometimes uh, more common than in other places. But the wind is almost omnipresent. So it's very reliable for bringing change in, in a natural change, uh, both during the day and after dark. So here's an example of um, enclosure. This is actually a courtyard. It's, it's a glazed courtyard, and, and um, um, we're looking through glass. This is all. This is glass. So is this, and we're looking through glass. Uh, but it's open to the sky, which is why the leaves of the uh, maple tree are moving. Right? The wind is actually in this courtyard, and um, but because there are no glazing bars and there's no frame, it really feels like the tree is in the space with it. So this is an example of you know, enclosure of an outdoor space with some kind of revealing element, like foliage or water or something, can effectively bring natural movement uh, into an indoor space. Here is an example. Um, of, it's not a video in this case, but by by deliberately underemphasizing the frame, the, the glass goes straight into the wall. There's no frame here. Um, only the frame of the door actually is is emphasized, right? There's no usual telltale sign here. So what the designer is doing by um, de-emphasizing the frame, hiding the frame, and basically through this kind of detail recessing it, um, and continuing the same materials across the glass barrier, both in the floor and in the wall, and even the bench is continued. Um, those kinds of design device can make any kind of change that happens out here, like the tree moving in the wind, for example, would very much feel like it was part of you. Now, if you change the materiality and put a big frame around this, we would have the normal reaction, which is, well, that's outside. That's not the same as in here. So you can use techniques to diminish the differentiation between inside and outside. And, and a very effective, two very effective ones is to, is to hide the frame that usually is the clue and also to continue materials, right? particularly floor materials, right? Um, because it's normal to say, well, this is an external material, so this will be stone and this will be out of the carpet or something. But if it's possible and, um, to continue them, um, then that has a big psychological effect. But this really feels like one space with a piece of glass down the middle. So any change that happens here really feels like it's in here. Again, enclosure. So here's an example of projection. Um, I, I hope you've seen this kind of. Um, so if um, the projection surface is sufficiently far away from um, foliage, then you get these uh, multiple images of what in fact is the sun. These are all images of the sun, but they're being created by diffraction through the leaves of the tree. Uh, you've almost certainly seen this. Right? Um, now, the distance needs to be about 100 feet, right? 30 meters or so, to the projection distance, so much larger than I've shown it here, actually. Um, um, 
if it's shorter, then you just get the standard um, foliage, which can be great. I mean, that that, that, that works too, but um, it can be more noticeable when you see something slightly less familiar, uh, which looks a bit like a piece of abstract art, only it's moving. Um, you know, those are natural forms, but that's the sun, and, um, and that movement is air movement. So it's sort of natural art. And by the way, this is being projected. I don't know if you can see this. This is a handrail. Right? This is being projected on an indoor surface. So this is what I mean by bringing, bringing natural change indoors without compromising geometry. This is coming through the glass. This is an example by Kengo Kuma in Tokyo. Um, now, there's not a very nice view around this Buddhist temple. It's right in downtown Aoyama in Tokyo. So uh, Kuma put up this translucent cladding, um, but very cleverly he placed this bamboo outside. So you get this wonderful effect of, of um, natural animation. Um, so you're aware of the wind and you're aware of nature, but you're not seeing all the buildings and the cars and things that are going by. So it's a terrific way. Translucent material is a great way of editing the view, uh, just keeping what you want and editing out what you don't want. So this is back again. So you can even do this with concrete blocks these days. Um, uh, there are companies, um, this is Lytra Crete, uh, where uh, they've put in optical fibers into the concrete. So you can now, this is the shadow then uh, that, that is being back projected through this translucent concrete block um, of this tree here. I hope you can just about recognize it. So it isn't just sort of glass and paper, even structural materials like concrete blocks can now be made translucent. Um, what we're seeing here are hundreds of uh, two inch square aluminum squares um, that are hinged at the top. Uh, and they are effectively um, Digital, they're only able to move in this kind of way, but they are actually creating um, a kind of Mexican wave, then I suppose, uh, showing the wind movement. Um, now, this was done by an artist called uh, Ned Cam, same spelling as Louis Cam, K A H N. He's done a number of these installations, uh, several at airports. Uh, there's one in Brisbane, there's one in San Francisco. Um, this one's called Wind Veil. Vale. Um, and he's an environmental artist. And uh, my reason for picking this up is that uh, this is on a parking structure just to make a, an ugly parking stru structure look a little more acceptable. But if it was a serious uh, habitable building, then it could easily be a shading device, for example. But it would be a shading device that actually um, also tells you about air movement. And air can move through this screen, I'll show you in a moment. Maybe I won't show you in a moment. Um, but those shadows are moving inside the space as well. Uh, water is a wonderful uh, material, a surface of water, a simple surface of water for showing air movement. You can just see what the air movement is doing right above the water here. Right? Um, but you can also see what the air movement is doing a thousand feet in the air by the movement of the cloud. And that's all being done by nothing more technical than a simple surface of water. Again, this is a Kengo Kuma project, but you know, it's water. It's not complicated. Another example of um, water revealing air movement. You can see how windy it is by the movement of these trees up here. So this, uh, the air is getting caught in a vortex here. Right. Now, if this were more glazed, um, this movement would seem like it was more part of the interior. None of these buildings, I think, were designed with this in mind, per se. These are the best examples that I could find. But imagine if you set out to design these things, how much better they could be. So you've all seen this kind of effect. These are technically known as caustics. Right? These are the concentration of sunlight into these bright bands, and then there are darker bands where there isn't concentration. 
So they're known as cor corticals. It's very simple. It's just reflection of concave surfaces um, uh, being concentrated into areas of bright light. And you see this under bridges as well. But you can also see it. Uh, this is the same building I just showed you, right? That reflecting pool on a sunny day, and um, it's actually projecting quite a lot of useful sunlight into the building, right? um, as well as this. You know, we're getting it here as well, and that's an important, you know, phenomenon in the sense that. Uh, I don't know about Indonesia, but I'd be willing to bet, just like in the States or anywhere else, there are hundreds of thousands of buildings that leave their lights on during the day because there is insufficient daylight, even though it's a bright sunny day. Outside. And then we complain about sustainability and, and global warming. So bringing daylight in without heating um, can be a really important, you know, not having electrical lights on during the day is really important. Um, you know, when this lecture is over, go around your campus and have a look at how many buildings have their lights on indoors. Well, you're not on campus now, probably, so you won't get to do that. But um, I can assure you, you know, even parking garages have lights on in Hawaii on bright sunny days, you know, which is which is criminal, really. There's no need for that. If they were properly designed, they could easily be daily. But by introducing this air movement, we can draw attention. We can draw people's attention to that. That light. If somebody says, "So what's with the funny patterns?" You know, what is that? Well, we can explain that this is created by little wavelets on the surface. So there's a bit of physics there. But why is it a good thing? Because it means that we don't have to turn the electrical lights on. Um, we can use the reflected light here, so that there's enough light without the electrical lights during the day. That saves our utility bills, but more importantly, it saves the planet. So here is a back projection of the same uh, caustics right, through a translucent material. It almost looks like it's on fire. Nothing but um, sunlight hitting a patch of water um, and being uh, that patch of water is being disturbed by the So after dark, um, you can do the same thing. If you have security lighting, for example, you can project it onto a water surface. And that's what's going on here. It's after dark. And you get the same caustic effects um, from those artificial lights, not just sunlight. So this is a, you know, one of the few examples where um, that kind of natural indoor animation can be brought in uh, during, during the hours of darkness. Because of course, you know, we stay up long after it gets dark. Right? Um, so um, wind is, is important for that reason. Right? Sunlight, obviously not available and rain is rare. So wind is, is much more usable for more of the time. Here's a famous painting by David Hockney showing the opposite effect, refraction of sunlight onto the base of a swimming pool. You've all seen this, right? these refraction patterns. Well, you can do the same thing in a building. And you may be thinking, how? Well, if you make your roof glass, and this is a building in uh, Nagoya in Japan, um, but a two inch roof pond and 100 feet below, 30 meters below, this is the effect of those refracted caustics. Now, a couple buildings that do the same thing. Right? These are photographs and not videos, but uh, this is a museum for a famous ship in the UK. So it feels like we're underwater, even though we're not, right? We can stand there. There's only a two inch um, pond above. And this is actually a swimming pool in uh, one of Pat Cow's houses in Vancouver, British Columbia. So a significant amount of water up there. The depth of the water makes no difference. It's a surface effect. So you get just as good acoustics if it's just two inches of water or four feet. Makes no difference because it is a surface effect. Um, talking of surface effects, uh, I hope you're aware of Isaac Newton's famous experiment where he demonstrated that sunlight is made up of all the different spectrum of colors, right? And he uses a triangular prism to demonstrate. It. If you're not aware of that, then Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon album from like 40 years ago has an image of it. But look up Isaac Newton's solar spectrum experiment. This is the same phenomenon, but in this case, the prism, the triangular prism, is just a V shape, which is filled with water, right? So it's translucent, but, but the body of the prism is water, and the top surface can be disturbed by the wind. 
and this is the effect. Oops, sorry. Um, and the effect. Uh, I'm not sure how to make that work. I'll use it. Uh, and this was done in a design studio, actually. A student built a, a scale model of this um, nursery. And so it's a real space, but it's a scale model. And um, not only does the solar spectrum move very slowly as the Earth moves, but it moves from moment to moment as the air disturbs the top of the, of the water. Um, this is an example of a camera obscura. Now, you may or may not have heard of that. You may have heard of, uh, in your kind of high school education in physics, the pinhole effect, where you can make a tiny hole and you will get an inverted image of whatever it is you're seeing on the other side, um, in, usually in a dark space. So that's essentially what's going on here. They, they take up the windows and they put some uh, four or five um, lenses, small lenses, which are taking live images of the exterior and projecting them inside, which is amazing um, that you can get live moving images. And I'll show you a moving image um, in a moment, simply using a lens. Um, you know, there's no, no wires, no electricity. You know? So this is like wireless closed circuit TV, basically. You do need a slightly dark surface. But still, you could have more light down here. This doesn't make much difference. But it, on a bright day, which you really need, um, um, you need to be able to darken whatever the surface you're projecting on. So here's an example. Uh, you're going to have to take my word for it. But um, uh, where uh, this is a ceiling. You can see the ceiling rose and the light coming down. But we're seeing images of a swimming pool outside. And somebody is playing around with a hose. Okay. So we're seeing, well, not live, but we're seeing moving images of somebody outside. And that looks like some sort of net right? um, being projected internally, which is extraordinary. And there's nothing high tech here. It's just simply, well, here's what we're looking at. Um, six inch lens. Um, now, you can do it this way. But if you restrict the aperture, you get a darker surface. And this is just indicating that if you really needed light, for example, in an office or something, well, you could bring the light in on the on the ground, still not using artificial light, and, and have this sort of animation going on above you. And there are plenty of work types um, where a, a dark surface and task lighting, lighting immediately on your desk, but not lighting everywhere, is actually quite useful. People who are doing fine work don't want light bouncing off the ceiling. So task lighting, lighting from desk lamps is, is super useful. And it's more economical as well, because if somebody doesn't need the light, they turn it off. Whereas if you have fluorescent lighting all over your interior, they, can, they tend to get left on, all of them. And I failed to mention it, but the biggest problem with leaving uh, all of those ceiling lights on is not the electricity used for the light, it's the heat that they produce. Because then you have to turn up the air conditioning to get rid of all that excess heat. So turning on electrical lighting in buildings is, is a double negative, right? Not only are you paying for the electricity to run the lights, but that's tiny compared to the electricity they then have to use to run the AC to get rid of all the excess heat that that lighting produces. And, and that's rarely pointed out. Most people don't know that. And it is a major contributor to um, wasted energy and therefore unnecessary damage to the environment. So any way that you can not turn the lights on, you know, saves in two ways. Sound is another way of just visual. Sound is a way that we can bring natural change. Sometimes that can be you know, like the disarm indoors, like the last slide, or sometimes it can be it's really nice, you know. I wish I was out there. Well, it isn't just the visual, especially after dark. The sound of, of outdoor uh, movement, air movement in particular. Um, the rain can be good as well. You can't obviously hear the sun, right? Um, but uh, you can certainly hear the wind, and you can certainly, if you put the right things in, in the way of the wind, right? And that's where architecture comes into play. 
we know enough from experience that if we put something in in the way of the wind, it'll either make a noise or what kind of noise it's going to make. Um, now, in Indonesia, I, I'm absolutely sure that wind chimes are a big thing. I, 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 I know that for a fact. You know? So um, this is a way of of making the wind audible. Right? It's, a, it's a an artifice, a human made device. And there are others. So wind generated movement, um, the big difference between wind uh, generated movement and sun generated movement is it's audible, right? As well as visual. And it's available most of the time, uh, notably after dark, which the sun clearly is not. So now we're on to our last, um, the last of the three elements, uh, rain. Um, some cultures, uh, this is a Zen temple in Kyoto, uh, already were aware of that the weather was not necessarily the weather treated it well, treated it well, could be an asset. understand that. Um, so basically what we have here is a is a rain curtain that not in an architect you'll see that or hear that term used in architecture but this is a real rain curtain a curtain of, of water and it's just one more screen along with all the other screens uh, and these layers right so um, rather than somebody saying well I won't go to the temple today because it's raining you might well say, I am going to go to the temple today because it's raining, because it's even more cool to watch or to look at this garden through this extra screen that you don't get every day. And what we tend to do or have tended to do, certainly in the West, is to treat the rain like an inconvenience. You know, we'll stick it in a, in a gutter, first of all, and then we put it in, a, in an ugly plastic pipe and we'll make it go into the stormwater system, which gets overwhelmed, of course, and then we have floods. Um, nowadays, of course, some countries are taking that water and putting it into storage and using it for the bathrooms and grey water, which is great. But what they rarely do is to show us the water on the way, to celebrate it, right? to, to show us the poetry of, of what it is. You know, this is pretty amazing. If, if, if I were to tell you a story that there's this transparent liquid that falls out of the sky that is essential for human life, you probably... If you didn't know rain, if you came from a different planet, you'd probably think that I was making up stories, right? A trans transparent material that falls out of the sky. And it is extraordinary. And then you look around, look at, look at the other planets in our solar system, for example. And, you know, we're the only one with this atmosphere. We're the only one where it rains water. I think maybe one of our other, maybe rain sulfuric acid. But, um, you know, I think Einstein said that, that nature is either... You take it for granted or you think it's extraordinary and maybe life you know um and um uh, it is actually extraordinary you know scientists tell us all the time that the probability that there are other uh, planets just like earth are like you know it's almost a certainty and yet uh, the number of other planets just like earth so far discovered is exactly zero so um you know this is pretty special and uh, being part of it is, is special. And yet we put ourselves in buildings and keep this stuff out, right? To a fault. Right? Again, I don't want to be wet, but you could be perfectly dry. You know, some of these screens in here are made of paper, but such is the distance and such is the design that it never gets wet. Right? So you can enjoy the rain, you can enjoy the weather, you can enjoy that natural change and still remain dry and cool or warm, whatever it might be. Um, this is a little more complicated to understand. This is a, 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 a scale model of a reading room, a little library um, at the University of Oregon. Um, but this is the part I wanted you to look at. Um, uh, this is actually plexiglass, but it could be translucent glass. So that was what it was intended to model. And there is a little rectangle that is transparent. We can see the view out. Right? But this has been roughed up with some uh, wire wool, metal wool, to mimic a, um, some etched glass. 
And uh, you may never have noticed it, but um, uh, when uh, a roughened surface and the rough surface on the outside gets wet, it gets darker. This is because light gets trapped in, in the water and doesn't come out. So the wet patch is always the darker patch. Right? This is dry, this is wet. In other words, when it begins to rain, this kind of surface, roughened etched glass, would reveal that rain. And you must have experienced um, wondering, do I take my umbrella or not? And we usually look outside and we look for puddles or we look at materials that change their color when they get wet to give us a clue. Is it raining? Is it about to rain? Um, uh, this you could build into a building and it would tell you um, when it began to rain. Now, once it gets completely wet, it, it loses its ability to tell us anything, right? But the onset of rain would be revealed by that. Um, this surface is inside a building, and what's happening is that a light from outside is shining through the glazing, and then it's projecting this, um, these beads of rain um, onto this internal surface. So even after dark, um, rain can be made visible. Same idea, uh, in this case, we have a, a shallow pool of water outside, which is being lit by an artificial light, and we're seeing the effect of rain on that through a translucent material, so it's back projected. So rain generated indoor animation. Um, uh, well, you can read this as well as I can. Um, so sound of rain is important, um, so it can be useful after dark. And there's overlap with uh, rainwater harvesting, which is the next thing I wanted to talk about, actually, the last thing, but maybe the most important. Um, everything I've shown you, or most of what I've shown you up to now, has been about improving the situation for people in buildings so that they are in connection with nature, um, which can help to calm us and reduce chronic stress in, in work environments where we don't have the freedom to just say, well, I want to go and take a walk now. You, know, you could do that, but you may not have a job when you come back, right? So, so in, not everybody is free to just go to nature whenever they want. So this is about bringing nature to them. And most of us work or study or whatever it is inside buildings of some kind. So can we bring nature in the form of the weather inside? And I hope you can see that there are ways of doing that. But there's a very important component to this that I started out um, uh, this presentation of talking about, which is um, sustainable practices, because sun, sunlight, wind, and rain are also the primary movers in every sense in sustainable practices. Um, so there's a huge overlap, a huge synergy between bringing the movements of the weather in to help human beings, but also using the movement of these elements to reveal, to make visible what are often uh, underused sustainable practices. So here's another problem, right? Uh, most sustainable indoor environmental control techniques are effectively, sorry, there should be an E in here, invisible to the general public. They don't do anything. They're passive. Um, they don't move, which is why, you know, you don't see, you know, um, it's very easy to miss uh, any kind of passive energy strategy, even when it's being used, because they don't usually talk. They don't, they don't move. Um, so we're back to this chat, right? Um, this looks complicated, but it's not. The, these are um, sustainable practices, and these are the three kinds of weather-generated visible movement. And um, all of them have checks, which means that they're all compatible. You can use wind-based with solar heating, and you can use rain-based with natural ventilation. Um, and you'll learn more about these techniques if you haven't already in, in the coming years, and they're important. But these are the basic, well, the top four are the basic passive environmental control, and the last one is, is what it is, it's rainwater harvesting. But you can also use water in passive environmental control in some environments. Um, but the black check marks indicate that it's actually not only compatible, this change is not only does it not undermine these passive techniques, but also um, can reveal, can make what would normally be static animated. 
can bring it potentially to the attention of, of people, not just building occupants, but anybody who experiences that building. So daylighting, um, I mentioned it earlier. Okay, this is that same building in a different part um, from the cafeteria, but uh, by having the daylighting animated, then we can start a conversation about, well, what are those patterns about? But why are you, you know, why is it important to bring that light in? Well, so that we don't have to turn the electric light on. Well, why? Because electricity damages the planet or the procurement of electricity damages our planet. There's a huge price to pay for electricity and it, it's not just the number at the bottom of your utility. There's a far more important price, which is the environmental price. So this is a way, imagine if this was just static light. Well, nobody's gonna ask the question, what is that? It's pretty obvious what it is, right? But when it moves like this, it's a way of starting a serious conversation through poetry. Instead of a dying polar bear, we have something beautiful, right? We have something that people go, cool, what is that? And it's a way of easing people, a different way to start a very serious conversation. That it's beautiful. Um, but it won't exist anymore if we keep doing what we, what we are doing to the planet. Um, here's a, a prototype of a um, light shelf. It's one that we made at the University of Army, and we put it into a medical waiting room um, to see what, uh, how the, the waiting patients. Uh, so these are caustics that are being projected. Um, so there's useful daylight, right? useful sunlight. Instead of turning the electrical lights on right, during the day, you know, there's, there's useful sunlight being projected off the roof, so you don't need to turn the lights on. Um, but also it's drawing attention to itself, and it's a positive distraction. When you're waiting to see a doctor, it's good to have something else to, to take your attention away from, you know, what sickness you've got and what the prognosis is going to be, or simply the boredom of having to wait. So, um, and this did have a, a you know, generally positive uh, reception. Um, so light shelves are intended to take excess light from inside a room to the back. This is what it looked like on the floor. It was uh, a transparent tray that was just attached to an existing window, a series of three trays um, with about an inch of water, and that's it. And that's the kind of effect that it can bring in, which is calming um, and... Um, and distracting in a good way. Um, if this were artificial, it would distract us from whatever we're doing, but we don't need to give this kind of change our conscious attention. We know what it is, right? We don't stop every time the wind moves um, the leaves on the tree and go, what was that? Unless it's excessive, right? And yet it keeps us attentive, it keeps us alert, but it's not like a siren or somebody shouting that automatically puts us into an alarm state and um, stresses us. Okay. So this is very important um, that nature, especially natural change, can keep us ticking over, can keep us alert, but without keeping us kind of tense, which is what, you know, when we receive human or artificial alerts, like email alerts or you know, you got another text or whatever, Every time you get one of those, you know, your blood pressure probably goes up slightly, right? It puts us into, because we're programmed to respond to those alerts, to like get ready, right? Nature does not have that effect. Very different. Right? So you spend three hours, you know, uh, texting or answering email or three hours in nature and, and your stress levels will be very, very different. Shading is another important, uh, especially in your part of the world, right? Uh, year two. Shading is a very important passive device. Well, um, you know, here's a way of drawing attention to shading. It's what I showed you earlier. And foliage is great, especially if it's um, uh, foliage that um, loses its leaves or planting that loses its leaves in the heating season in temperate climates. So you can allow sunlight, low angle sunlight in the winter, but you keep it out with a full foliage canopy in the summer. But again, the movement is a way of starting that conversation. Um, this is a little clearer. I hope you can see the convection currents that I was talking about earlier, right? So this is, this is seeing heat, 
right, which is counterintuitive, but we are seeing the effects of heat in the different densities of the air. If you made a shade awning out of a metal, for example, it is going to get very, very hot, but it's going to keep the sun from entering this space. But you would be able to see those shadows of the heat coming off of that awning, right? None of the heat's actually coming in, but you'd be able to see those shadows inside the space. In other words, this shade awning would be telling us, would, would be showing us just how much heat it was keep preventing from entering the space. And that's what I mean by making buildings talk and making passive passive strategies speak to the people who use them. So that they know what's going on, they, they can see it in action. So here's um, uh, the little diagram is uh, how a roof pond can work in a uh, dry, very hot, dry environment. Desert environments are very good for this, for example. So um, the, the water, water you may not know, has four times the thermal capacity of concrete. So it can store four times as much concrete as thermal energy without um, a rise in temperature than, than concrete. So a great thermal storage. Um, and in a desert environment or any place where uh, there's very little cloud, you would then insulate that at night and the water would give up its heat and it's getting freezing. It's famously very, very cold in the desert at night, right? Uh, to the point that this would freeze over. Um, but you insulate it so all of its heat gets given up to the occupants, right? So, um, Again, uh, this phenomenon, um, sorry, the one before, let me see if I can go back. So this, what we're seeing here is primarily wind driven movement. Um, but if you were in a very warm climate, um, part of that would be thermal convection currents as well. So you'd be able to see the heating of um, as that um, uh, thermal storage mass is, is gradually getting warmer. Um, even more likely, if you could put a storage, a thermal storage tank internally, which is sometimes done, uh, because water is such a great thermal storage material, uh, if you shade the top of that column of liquid, it doesn't have to be water, um, the bottom will heat disproportionately. You can increase the intensity of the sun with a lens, for example. And then if you place something in that column, you will be able to see when your thermal storage tank started to charge because there would be a temperature gradient. This would be cooler than that. This is going to rise. And if there's some kind of disclosing agent, you know, these are little globules of oil, for example, in an aqueous or water liquid, you would see that until this column of liquid reached thermal equilibrium and then everything would settle down. But when there is a temperature gradient, there's convection and any kind of disclosing agent, any kind of slightly heavier than water um, object is going to get disturbed and kicked up by the convection. And like I say, it's going to tell you, unlike a dumb piece of concrete, it's going to tell you and show you that it's charging with heat. Natural ventilation, well, um, here's an example. Um, what we're looking at are moray patterns, and I hope you from your high school physics know that that's, they're often produced by two overlap grids uh, that are moving in relation to each other. The two grids in this case, or the two meshes, are uh, an insect screen right? and a, a net curtain. And the, net cur the insect screen is fixed, and the net curtain is just being allowed to move in the wind, and that is what's producing these different moray patterns. So you, you can imagine if you were high up in a building, I wasn't when I filmed this, right? I'm on the third floor maybe, and you can still see the tops of trees. But if you're on the 33rd floor, which I am right now, no trees, right? You're not gonna get trees up here. So how am I gonna know how the wind's blowing? Well, I have a plant on my balcony, you know, sure. But what if I don't have a balcony? Well, you could, put something on the facade that would actually demonstrate. And if you were using natural ventilation, it would also show um, how that air was was moving and how that air was coming into your into your space. Oh, here we're back to that uh, Ned Cam sculpture. This is the inside. So these are the aluminum 
flare panels. And you can see they just move marginally. But you can see the wave of the wind, the gust of wind. That if this was a shading device, not only would it be showing us shade, but also air movement uh, as natural ventilation comes through here. Now, this was not designed with that in mind. It was designed more as an art piece. But in the hands of an architect, as a shading device, it could not only reveal shade, um, but also reveal air movement, two very important passive design strategies um, in many parts of the world, including in the industry. Um, here's water revealing air movement. Okay, so these are known as cat's paws. I don't know why. These little um, ripples that you see, um, disturbance by the wind. Um, this happens to be at the top of the same temple in the middle of Tokyo uh, by Kengo Kuma. We're on the 15th floor. And this is a, a place where uh, family members wait uh, during funerals, actually. So it's kind of solemn, but we are 15 stories off, but a very calm space. Now, you can imagine if we were in a place um, that was not human, that was dry, and we opened up these doors, um, the air that's coming in would be several degrees cooler as a result of passing over this water. Uh, uh, the water would uh, sl be slightly um, evaporated, and that is um, that process takes energy, so the air is going to drop in temperature. So not only would you get the pleasant breeze, but slightly passively cooled breeze as well, just by allowing that natural ventilation to pass over a surface of water. Now, that doesn't work everywhere. Um, it has to be in a place where um, there isn't a lot of humidity, so it probably wouldn't work in, in your part of the world. Just about works in Hawaii. But in places like Southern California, Arizona, um, very effective. And then finally, rainwater harvesting. Well, rainwater harvesting has been going on for a very, very long time, right? Before um, we had piped water, and the Romans had piped water, but not everywhere, um, certainly in um, Saharan, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, they still use these techniques to right? so use the roof of a building to um, direct any rainfall into a central gathering container, and then it goes into storage underneath. Um, so you're all, you will hear the word atrium throughout your architectural life, and most of the time it's, it's misused. Okay, so we're looking at a Roman atrium here, right? But the business end of a Roman, and a real atrium has no glass on the top, by the way. If it has glass on the top, it's not really an atrium because an atrium is designed to collect rain. And if it's got a glass on the top, it ain't collecting any rain. So rain comes in here, it comes in, and this is the impluvium. This is the business end, the, the, the shallow pool where the water falls. And then it goes into storage. It slowly percolates, it's filtered through to storage. Um, and you know the whole space is the is an atrium, um, but the business end of an atrium is the impluvium. Right? It's it's a rainwater catching device as well as daylighting, of course. And um, you may have noticed that um, down here, what's going on here is that uh, during hot weather, the Romans noticed that if you refilled the impluvium with water, somehow it cooled the surrounding spaces. Now we know that's by evaporative cooling. But they certainly figured it out. So this is an extraordinarily sophisticated, subtle, passive design where you're collecting rainwater for all kinds of use, including drinking, but you're also using it for cooling the environment on, on hot, sunny days as well. Here's an atrium in a contemporary building in Kawasaki. There's a great big hole in the roof here, so it's a real atrium. And, and it's raining inside of this atrium outside carrying them both. It's pouring. Nobody's getting wet because it's in the middle of this pool. Okay, so um, it's perfectly possible. Uh, this particular atrium, uh, um, they can even close the aperture at the top during typhoons, so it's, it's, it's very cleverly designed. Now, it's not being used for rainwater harvesting. But imagine if it were, then we, you know, the conversation would be, well, what's going on here? Well, we're gathering rain and we're going to use it later for, you know, flushing the toilets or whatever, watering the garden. Earlier, 
during uh, different weather. So uh, water is the perfect surface for revealing falling water. Standing water reveals falling water. So this is what a fish sees when it's raining. But this is the same pond we saw earlier, bringing a different form of natural change into it. But if this was designed and it's not, or if this was connected to a cistern underground, then that conversation would be, well, what's going on with the glass roof? Well, you know, this water that you're seeing on the glass roof is finding its way into an underground cistern and we're going to recycle that. Um, so, you know, these poetic phenomena effects are very nice and they can make indoor uh, environments much more habitable, but they can also be connected to very serious, passive, sustainable design strategies to start very important conversations through poetry rather than horrific scenes of wildfires and dying polar bears, etc. Here's rainwater harvesting. There is a cistern. Quieten this one down. There is a cistern under here. There's a grill underneath this rock. So this roof has been, it's a very large roof, and, uh, but it's only got one spout and there's no, there's no downspout, there's no tube. The water is being celebrated, right? That we're collecting all this rain from this large roof, we're concentrating it in this one corner, and then we're gonna show it to you in a cascade waterfall on its way into underground storage for reusing. Great example of starting a conversation. But if, if this was a plastic tube, there's no conversation. Nobody sees it. Nobody knows about it. So it's very important, you know, and it's our job right, to design buildings that talk about what they're doing. If they are using sustainable practices, they have to say so. They have to shout it. Can't afford timid, quiet buildings anymore. We're in a crisis. So here we are after dark in that same um, uh, space. And in this case, the the ripples of rain on this external pool are being uh, reflected onto the ceiling. And it's after dark. So here's a, a quick summary. I'm not going to go through them all because I'm, I'm, I've just noticed the time. Um, but these are examples of how uh, natural animation can be made to um, draw attention to very common passive strategies, including rainwater harvesting. And this just talks about um, the most effective and these micro courtyards are some of the most effective means, but they're only really applicable to new build. Right? It's not really feasible to do this in an existing building, it's too expensive. But any building, the two below, Pretty much any building, most buildings have windows, and these can be easily, these devices can be easily retrofitted to existing, um, as we did on that medical clinic. Right? Um, so it's important to differentiate between what's practical for existing buildings, which is the vast majority of buildings are not going to go away anytime. There's too much money and other things invested in them. So it's important to think about our existing building stock, because we can't just rebuild everything overnight. It's going to take a long time. So dealing with, with our existing building stock is enormously important. Retrofit is, is a hugely important. How do we make our existing buildings more sustainable? So um, just to sum up, um, wind generated movement, or sorry, weather generated movement uh, reduces stress. Um, it can maintain alertness without being distracting. So we can do our job, we can study, we can work um, uh, without like, paying conscious attention, but it still keeps us alert. Uh, it can draw attention to uh, just underused and undernoticed sustainable practices. It's available everywhere, and best of all, it's free. So there is a book about this. Um, like I said, uh, that was finished about two years ago. Um, and uh, it's available in two forms, digital and paper. Um, well, there are two reasons that I prefer the digital. First of all, the, the videos are more available. You can still see the videos in the paper uh, version, but it's more expensive um, and you have to scan it with a smartphone. So it's a lot easier to just buy that um, if you want to buy it. Um, 
to use the uh, ebook and the video. One of the reasons that this, this research took so long was it took a very long time to be able to find a platform where you could actually design the pages, but also um, uh, have the, um, and not have the text flow, for example, but have the videos embedded. And finally, a couple of years ago, it became possible to do that on several different platforms. That wasn't the only reason, but. Uh, and again, none of these buildings were designed with this in mind. You know? So this is really just the, the, the tip of the iceberg in the sense of what could be done if designers consciously set about deliberately trying to draw attention to sustainable practices using these kinds of So there are about 50, uh, I believe, uh, 50 brief video clips in, in, in the book. And you've seen a small selection. So. And, and uh, this, this book then, um, it won a couple of awards. Uh, it was an unusual, I can say the embedding of the um, of the videos was was unusual at least a couple of years ago. ago it was so, uh, um, and it is available, I think, on certainly available from World Scientific, the publisher, but also on the Apple and the Amazon and the Kobo. Um, so if you just look up naturally animated architecture, you should be able to find. It. Like I say, the, the hardback is expensive, but the ebook is 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 pretty reasonable. So. Um, thank you very much for listening. I've realized uh, an hour and a half for me has gone very quickly, but for you, it's obviously very different. So I will, uh, I'll stop sharing and uh, maybe give you guys a break. Uh, thank you very much, Kevin. Very, very interesting presentation and congratulations for the book as well. <laughs> thank you. Uh, how, how the student can act? Is it available, uh, free available from online or the student have to buy it? Uh, it's not free. Um, uh, it's, I can't remember. I think it's something like 19, $19. $19. So okay. Okay. That's good. It's, yeah. it's easy expensive, but the ebook has come down in price. So, uh, um, yeah, if you look it up, uh, I don't know what most of your students use, but it's on the Apple platform, but it's also on the, uh, Amazon Kindle. Um, um, I could send you the link, uh, Chemist, if you're interested. I, I don't have it available for me now. I might be able to put it in there. Um, I don't want to spend time messing around with that now because I'm not actually here to sell books. You know, I'm, uh, the ideas are far more important. You know, um, uh, so for me, Chemist, this is a great uh, privilege to be able to talk to, especially younger designers who, whose futures uh, are ahead of them. You know. Now is the time, and in high school even, to draw these things to people's attention. You know, our generation, with all due respect, you know, we're not going to change. You know, well, maybe we can. You know, the only way that I feel that I can do make any kind of change is through students, through writing and 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 talking. Right? I'm not going to be out there building buildings, but um, but the main emphasis is it, it doesn't matter quite, you know, how many buildings you do. But if they are of the right kind, then they can have a huge ripple effect and um, draw attention to these. So I think buildings as teachers might be an alternative title to this. You know, um, absolutely. So, yeah. So the, yeah, and I, the in, the interesting thing about your lecture is your lecture is about uh, how architecture and building response and take advantage of uh, the climate, the dynamics of climates from sun, wind, rain, and all uh, chains of times. And it's not only cover uh, contemporary era, but also covering 
some historical aspect of the building that when you show the Pantheon, when you show the Tado under buildings, yeah, and and I think it's very good for the students to to know that, and it's how we uh, have a sensitivity uh, throughout uh, designs based on climates. That's uh, not only analyzes the sun cycles, but how to take advantage of these things to the the design, sustainable designs. And I think the other thing is uh, many, uh, some old buildings like, Hen maybe you remember Henry Labrus, the uh, library in uh, Paris and also uh, Barcelona pavilions in in Barcelona, they they have a, a transparent glass uh, win windows and also have the pool reflected to uh, the area. And but it's it's and then uh, the phenomena of Crystal Palace, for instance, that has been uninstalled. It's do you think at that times uh, architects still did not very aware about the climates compared to today? Yeah, while their design also have showing this uh, uh, the dynamic of climates. For instance, uh, your observations on pantheons. I think it's very interesting that so. The thing, the the historian, the, the historical architecture and the architects in the past do not really showing their uh, uh, climate things, or do they know about these things? But in other way, I think in many cases it was poetic chemists. Uh, you know that they were not. Although clearly, in the case of the atrium, it was it was. A little bit of both, and possibly mostly practical, um, you know, through through trial and error, um, I suppose, or or seeing other examples. But uh, um, so clearly, as we've talked about previously, as you talked about in your talk uh, to my students, to my class, uh, vernacular architectures of varying kinds have, again, through trial and error, through human experience, have um, um, have figured out. Oh, if we do it this way, it's actually more pleasant. You know, um, they were usually not thinking about the planet. You know, that, that, you know, we weren't thinking about the planet until 30 years ago, right? I'm, you know, I, I have a degree in environmental design, but it was all about the environment of the building. Nobody even thought about what what effect are we having on on the environment outside. You know, so nowadays, I hope you know any environmental design course is obviously. So I'm not sure if I'm answering the question. I think most of the time, um, uh, I mean, the big difference, chemists, is a great question, is that they were almost certainly uh, interested in the sort of poetics and they were interested in the practical, you know, we, we, we need water, how do we collect it? And, you know, and I'm sure that the Romans, for example, would have enjoyed just watching the rain, you know, uh, in, in the impluvium or whatever, I, I, it must have been part of the animation, part of the dynamics of. Uh, imagine being in a domus, right? The Roman house would be very different if that was glazed. You know, everything would be kind of static, right? But the moment it begins to rain, uh, there must be houses like that. I'm absolutely sure. In fact, I've seen them in Bali, you know, and then probably all over Indonesia, where a pool of water, you know, is a great a wonderful, you know, in a courtyard is a wonderful means of animating and cooling, both physically and psych and psychologically, cooling people. Um, so I'm sure a lot of what I've shown you, in fact, you know, none of the phenomena that I've shown are new. They're all very, very common outside, and and perhaps the only difference is that um, I'm encouraging. Um, students and, and architects to um, bring those phenomena deliberately inside 
but there are cultures, as you as you point out, Kenneth, that have done that. Um, um, and I think it's mostly 20th century Western architecture that has forgotten or never learned that. You know, there are plenty of cultures around around the Pacific um, and in Asia where these things have been done, but Western modernism, not so much, right? Um, so um, I'm not yeah. sure if that question comes. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, uh, and for the old student, can you turn on your video? So we will uh, have, uh, uh, Kevin, is it okay that we continue with question and answer or? And there is one, uh, there's one question I'm just seeing in the chat. Yeah, right? there, there, oh. there, there are uh, three questions. Okay. Yeah, can can I can I read here? Yeah? Sure. The, the first one from Jose Fabrian, and he uh, he asks uh, regarding the projections. Do these projections have a practical functions in a building besides emotional or aesthetic quality for a uh, human? Yeah, um, but so the projections, um, yeah, they, they, they do. Um, so you remember the example of the uh, reflections from a water surface, that's light. So that light means that, um, as I said a couple of times, uh, you don't have to turn as many lights or maybe even any electrical lights on. Um, so the use of a water surface as a Many people misunderstand the reflecting pool. They think it's you know just limited to the Taj Mahal where you see a reflection of the building. The, the real purpose of a reflecting pool is to reflect light uh, into the building, at least these days. So, uh, but the but the point is, if if that light is animated, it can draw attention. So there is uh, absolutely a purpose of that projection, um, primarily bringing light. Uh, daylight. So daylighting is a very important passive strategy because the alternative is that um, we have to turn on electrical lighting, which uses electricity, and then we have to turn on the AC to get rid of the heat that the lighting, the artificial lighting produces. So anytime that you can light a building naturally, you are saving an enormous amount of energy and saving the planet. Um, there's another question a bit further down, chemist, that talks about heat and and you're absolutely correct there has to be a balance Every, when you when you bring in um, direct sunlight even if it's being reflected off a um, there is some heat coming with it and you know according to wherever you are in the world you know there has to be a balance um, uh, but diffusing that light and making the bringing the light in indirectly can reduce any additional heat load to a minimum, you know, so it wouldn't be wise to just say, well, we'll just have massive areas of glass to improve our daylighting. Meantime, uh, you know, the solar gain on the building is becoming enormous. But you, anytime you bring in light or sunlight, direct sunlight, and it's not diffused, um, you are going to bring some heat in. Uh, I'm not a physicist, but I believe if it's diffused, then a lot of the heat component is also going to be uh, taken out of it, but I'm not entirely sure about that. Um, it's a great, it's a very good question. But in the first, the answer to the first question is, yes, daylighting is enormously important for saving energy and the planet. Um, so you want that to come in, but you don't always in a northern climate or a temperate climate that heat is usually not a problem. But in a climate like yours, uh, it's a trickier balance to get daylight without the heat. And I think. Diffusion and reflections um, are one main uh, means of bringing light in and uh, reducing the heating effect of that light, as opposed to direct sunlight penetrating the interior, which will have an enormous heating effect inside, which you don't want. Um, sorry, chemist, you were in the middle of reading. That. Yeah, no, no, that's okay. Yeah. So, uh, your your answer cover the second questions yeah it's about uh the heat yeah right yeah yeah so do you want to uh safira 
Yeah, there's a there's a second uh, there's yeah. a, a question about winter climate. Um, um, yeah, I mean, uh, by winter, I assume just a regular winter and not uh, sort of uh, Alaskan, um, you know, or inside the polar circle or whatever. But uh, um, there's no reason um, why uh, the fact that, it, this, that this is remote, that, for example, using projection or even the enclosure, the whole idea is to bring in the movement of the weather without the weather, right? And unless you want the weather. There are a couple of examples where you'd like the weather to come in. If you're in a, a hot, humid environment, you would like the actual wind to come through the building, natural ventilation. But if you live in a temperate climate or a cold climate, you don't want the wind to come in. So by projection or even the courtyard, you can have the effect of the wind without the wind. You can see the wind moving, whatever the material, the water or the foliage, without actually, you know. Um, the ideal situation is you have a choice. So when it's too cold, you close the glass. And when it's warm enough that you say a breeze would be nice, you can you can open it up. But, uh, but it's that remote, um, you know, using the envelope of the building to say, uh, I don't want this actual element, but I want to be aware of its movement um, uh, is, is sort of central to this. Right? Um, and if you imagine that most buildings have, are designed with the idea that these elements are not good, although clearly in your tradition, bringing wind into buildings, as we learned from your uh, talk a few weeks ago, Camus, is, you know, is the norm. I'd be very interested um, to find out how many buildings in, in Indonesia use uh, just natural ventilation and how many uh, have reverted to artificial air conditioning these days. Is, is natural ventilation used in office buildings or on campus at all? Yeah, yeah. In the campus, previously we uh, the campus designed with natural ventilations, but uh, in some office being closed, uh, uh, the ventilation being closed and put the uh, sad, very sad that it was uh, put air conditions. <laughs> so, same. but yeah, yeah same uh, thing. Uh, you know, uh, people are, it's an educational problem. You know, it's not just changing buildings. Um, it's a question of changing people's thinking, you know, and maybe, I don't know, I may be over enthusiastic about this, but, but you know, the same phenomenon chemists that we've had on our campus, and I think it's true elsewhere, that people just are convinced that it's more comfortable and more convenient to just have a machine. And, and they have not registered that by by putting on that machine, they're damaging the planet, you know? um, and that's yeah. a tough. You know, to... Yeah, and uh, many houses that built before 1980 yeah, or 1970, they they have very good uh, ventilations, very good uh, uh, window that make a sun array. Uh, can intervene into the interior, but uh, today with many uh, development of the building technology and considerations about climate is not really uh, put into the the priority. But yeah. I think uh, with this COVID nineteen pandemic. People try to rethink about the healthy space, for instance. Yeah, and yeah. your presentation, I think it's it's very good to show uh, that the bacteria can be killed by a sun array, or uh, if we if if we design the the bathroom which without uh, ventilation, without 
natural a uh, uh, light that will increase the risk of the bacteria to to grow. So I think it's important message from your presentation for today uh, in this situation COVID nineteen pandemic. That's a really good point, Emerson. Back in May, um, I didn't write about what you've just described, but um, uh, but back in May, I did write something. Um, online about the fact that people were even more spending even more time indoors than that you know 90 percent before it was probably 99 percent during the lockdowns right so but i had not thought about uh, until you mentioned it now but um um because i've had this argument with people uh, when i've said this is a great argument against um, air conditioning. If you think about it, air conditioning, um, unfortunately, we've, we've, we have all come to understand a word that didn't have any meaning to most of us. One year ago, if you'd said to me, what's a ventilator? I would have said, is that an AC unit? Now, of course, I understand medically, sadly, I understand what that is, right? And we understand ventilators are for extremely sick people who cannot breathe on their own. But think about it. That's a description of an air conditioner. Our buildings are on ventilators. They can't breathe on their own. If you took away the AC, you know, most of those buildings are sealed shut, right? They don't, you can't even open the windows. You know, these are seriously sick buildings, right? That if you take away, you take them off the ventilator, they can't breathe, you know? Yeah, and absolutely. I tried to pitch that argument to an editor and they said, oh, no, we can't publish that because, um, you know, I grew up in Washington, D.C., and you die without air conditioning. And it's like, but what you're telling me about um, pathogens, you know, about bacteria, and, um, uh, you know, now we're all being told, if you can do it outside, do it outside. Because any building, any confined space, and, and it isn't just... Um, COVID, of course, you know, when we go to a doctor's waiting room, you know, I've been in doctor's waiting room where there's no operable window. So I'm sitting there, we're all sitting there. Everybody there presumably is sick. Some people probably have colds or flu or something worse. Nobody would be wearing a mask before COVID, right? Kind of the worst possible environment. You know, let's gather a bunch of sick people together and have them sit for an hour together in an artificially controlled breathing the same air over and over so i really take your point chemists uh, it's um you know the the physical health um is is uh, there there has been a little bit of research done on that and um uh and and it will i think it will change um back in the 1920s after the spanish flu um, and also uh, tuberculosis was a huge problem. Um, you would be aware of it, but uh, you might show your students, you know, the, those uh, hospitals where you, you know, even Finland, you'd have rows and rows of patients in the open air in sub-zero temperatures because that was the only treatment for tuberculosis, which is a killer. You know? um, so, you know, it's freezing cold and they're out, so it's outdoors in the sun with you know wrapped up in blankets and uh, there's a famous one by Alvar Aalto right uh, mm. I'm, I can't pronounce the name it begins with P but I think you know we human beings seem to they learn something or other and then they then when the emergency's gone away they forget you know and then they another you know back in the I can't when was the Crimean War I think it was in the 1800s wasn't it um Florence Nightingale, right? She reinvented or you know, sort of a hygienic hospital. Natural ventilation was a key part of the Nightingale wards where every patient had a window that'd be cross ventilation. And she understood even before bacteriology that somehow good ventilation prevented infection or reduced infection. And then of course, you look around hospitals now and they are all artificially, you can hardly open a window. And it's deeply unhealthy because those air conditioning systems are very rarely cleaned. So they build up not just bacteria, but dust and mites and Legionnaire's disease and stuff like that. 
Um, so I think we're in the process, chemists, of relearning a lesson that human beings have learned at least twice before and forgotten. You know, it's kind of the way it goes. Yes, absolutely, Kevin. I I really agree with you that, uh, and when uh, Le Corbusier designed Philosophy and then proposed uh, five points for uh, good architectures that with the pillar T's means that the building have to be uh, up above the grounds and ribbon windows and the applications of the roof garden, the applications of the uh, internal courtyards. That's, it seems that, uh, it seems that uh, the building must be uh, show the the healthiness of life yeah and uh, not not only showing the idea of machine uh, interesting yeah. I thought about that chemist uh, you know as yeah. you were defining that i'm thinking wow that's one that's two you know there's so raising it up as you know very well right was very big part of your vernacular architecture right um it seems like and the courtyard i've been talking about that a lot this evening right um, the ribbon windows, although they might be, you know, that language, although I don't know, because I haven't really studied Corbusier, I mean, I know vaguely, but I, I haven't really um, paid much attention to his environmental. Um, I know that he was, he had the theory that more daylight would come in through a ribbon window than through a vertical window. And um, and he did some diagrams of, you know, sort of the daylight penetration. I'm not sure how, how, you know, about the physics involved, but, uh, um, but that is interesting. That, ironically, his language, his vocabulary, would make an extremely um, good set of passive techniques. And I'm so used, to chemists, of, you know, Luca Busi is usually my target. You know, it's kind of like. Uh, because he's not interested in place, you know, he's not really interested in specific culture, or at least before the war, you know, so usually I'm used to sort of like hammering him for like international uh, anonymous architecture, but uh, now you mention it, he, uh, he has, what are the five of them? Pilotti, courtyard, ribbon window, what are the other two? Uh, roof garden. Yeah, yeah, and uh, that, that's four. That's, uh, and and um, uh, flexible, uh, uh, flexible space. Yeah. Open, open space, open plan. Yeah, yeah. Which of course helps cross ventilation. Absolutely. That's, I might write a paper on this, chemist. You know. Would you like to write a paper on this? Because uh, uh, maybe we could cooperate on this. Because I think that's so, so interesting. I don't know that that's been really looked at. You know, the, yeah, the... it it's it was designed after the Spanish flu uh, attack uh, Europe Europe in uh, early 20th century, and the idea to bring up the healthy uh, buildings, yeah, rather than creating the massive and very. Yeah. So I think the flexible design is one of the. Uh, attempt to uh, the earlier attempt to to solve the the problems of the uh, the space that at the time uh, yeah. flourished by art yeah more art nouveau or uh, dirt yeah, break burn so I think yeah this is one of the first uh, yeah uh, I've never that kind of analysis of an environmental, you know, I've always looked at the Villa Savoy as exactly as you described, you know, as a um, more of a technical, you know, um, you know, the machine for living rather than, but now you're describing it, it's, it's more than that, you know, it's actually a pretty sophisticated, um, um, I'm serious, I, I, I think I'd like to think about what it's, yeah. um, if you take some of the strategies that I've been describing, and then you look at those particular built forms, it, it's almost like, well, you've got the foliage, there can easily be water in there, I'm not sure if there was, but there could easily be water there, you've got perfect cross ventilation, um, uh, because of the open 
open plan. Um, I think uh, maybe Corbusier uh, hasn't had the credit that he deserves for. I, I'm not sure how much of it. I mean, I've never heard of the environmental um, credentials of, of Corbusier's work. Uh, and that may be just, you know, a great big gap in my reading, but I think it's not, it's not well known, you know. That, yeah. that, and I think he, he didn't talk a lot about these things, but from his design that he show his awareness about the sensitivity yeah. towards the environment, towards climate. I think you, see, you can see from Unité de Habitation, for instance, I think it's truly show his uh, yeah. concerns about daylighting enter into the apartment from both sides. So I think this is interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that I, I, uh, I mean, the only thing that I and every student knows are the Brie Soleil, but you're absolutely right. Those, you know, the, the, the two one apartment, which I've always thought were great. Um, uh, I'm not so keen on the completely windowless corridor, but the, the double sided, uh, you know, I don't know about you, but I'm constantly telling my students, you know, don't design double loaded corridors because you'll kill any opportunity for cross ventilation. Yeah. Um, uh, so, you know, here he has this apartment um, where if you've got a breeze, you can let it come straight through. Um, interesting. Yeah. I, need, I need to give Le Corbusier another look, you know. Um, yeah, um, yeah I, I truly agree with you that uh, double corridor is not uh, the best solutions. Yeah. And, but in fact, many developer try, uh, they choose double corridor to reduce mm. <laughs> the, uh, to get a com more commercial uh, advantage, but it's not good. And here, even in Indonesia, that now all the apartment design use double corridor, which is previously in the past, that single corridor is uh, the best yeah. choice. Yeah. But Today yeah. it's suddenly that it's it's. Uh, uh, your your colleague, uh, 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 Johannes uh, Widodo, showed us. I think it was Johannes. Um, some interesting projects by companies like Wuha, uh, and uh, who are starting to um, put apertures. You know, so it's a double loaded corridor, but it's staggered and there are gaps between units so air can move through, you know. And Absolutely. Uh, yeah. This is one of the strategy to for the double corridor. They have to have a gap yeah. in between to, to make uh, air flow into the yeah. corridor very well. Yeah. Yeah, um, uh, yeah they, 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 I'm a little bit biased, I suppose, but this stuff matters, you know, and, and um, Hawaii does a very poor job. Um, you know, we have a very, I don't know, benign climate, but, you know, 90% of the buildings use AC, they don't have to, but they, they just use AC and, and they're rather, un, you know, very unimaginatively designed. So there's, you know, it's not, it's not a small problem. It's, it's, Pretty much everywhere, and uh, um, uh, and we don't have uh, a particularly hot or humid climate, and it never gets seriously cold, you know. Um, but I'm I have hope. I have hope, in, you know, um, in the next generations of architects who who once they're aware of the problem, you know, their architecture is not a fashion parade. It's not making art, you know, it's not getting famous, you know, compared to all of those things, you know, saving the planet is, <laughs> well, there's no kind of, you know, there is no fashion, there is no being famous if there's no planet left, you know, I can't imagine being in a more um, precarious, but also this is being a designer, it's never been more important, you know, in my opinion, because it's not just about fashion or or designing cool buildings you know cool in the sense of you know not, not physically cool um uh but it's you know there's a lot of responsibility on you and i and, and other educators but you know that the next generation is 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 capable to talk of talking to developers and saying look um 
would you like to just make some money, but your children have no planet? Um, you know, so they'll die rich, but they'll die young, you know, or something. Um, uh, or, you know, can we talk about this and, you know, can we, can we, sure, you need to make a profit. We understand that, but can Absolutely. we, can we have the planet and be wealthy and healthy too, you know, and, um, and it, that takes great intelligence and, uh, to, uh, for designers to be able to, to confidently talk to the people who finance buildings, government and, and privately, you know, we, we've been talking recently here about, um, seriously about, uh, starting a real estate course, um, you know, and it isn't just about making money, although that would, you know, that, that would, you know, the only people who make money out of buildings, of course, are people in real estate. I shouldn't say that all oh, the architects will leave to go to real estate. But being able to understand that business and talk the language of developers and, and realtors is, is important for architects. And most architects don't have a clue about the real decision making that goes on. And then you go out into practice and it's a huge shock that it's not design studio anymore. People are saying, but if we do it that way, we'll save 10 square feet. And then they get the calculator out and they'll tell me how much money that is. And you kind of go, this happened to me, you know? So I still remember it. I'm, I was absolutely appalled, you know? If we detail this marble around this building this way, instead of that way, and then we do it all, all around the building and then on 15 floors, this is how much money we just saved. And I was like, you know, <laughs> wow, nobody, <laughs> Uh, in school yeah <laughs> okay okay, okay. okay. yeah kevin uh thank uh students do you still have any more questions if you don't want to write you can raise your hand uh well we still have some a few minutes before we end this session any more questions yeah i think uh Kevin lectures today is uh, very interesting and very inspiring for all the students because the students might be will be uh, an architects professional architects in the futures or developers or contractors yeah so the the environmental issues the environmental concerns is very important and even uh, for today that we experience uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemics and I think issue about the healthy space, healthy environments and how the building can respond to the the climate change. Yeah. Uh, you uh, reduce the, uh, the, the carbon uh, uh, that polluted the, the air. Yeah, and this is the architect's responsibility to creates better space for for better living for uh, for human and today kevin kevin lectures in i think it's inspiring and not many uh architects yeah, have a sensitivity towards the the, the uh, climate uh, designs and then in indonesia i think it's a challenge that uh it seems for some people the design is very expensive yeah, with the uh, requirement requirement but in terms of sustainability for the continuous living i think it's it's important and very good solution and uh, another thing that's in indonesia that we have uh, people who who live in dense very dense area uh, or we called it urban kampung and it's a challenge how the spatial quality of the dwellings of the people can have a response to the climates i think it's still need to be addressed and from kevin uh, lectures that's uh, uh, it's also show the vernacular building uh, respond to the climate, like the the Japanese uh, building, yeah? and then with the uh, I think your your photo about the the breeze, about the wind blowing into the interior of the 
is it Malay stage house, the open? I think it, I, you know, I think it is. That's a good, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. The wooden, uh, I think it's wooden, wooden buildings, yeah, like a stage house. I think it's very interesting. It's open air and very comfort, convenience. For, and this, this student then uh, have a challenge for the future to have a designs that can uh, respond to the tropical climate like in Indonesia that have different contexts with other countries. That's, and yeah. your, your lecture is very truly inspiring for the students. And oh, the student, great. if you would like to buy <laughs> Kevin books, it's available online. How much? 19 US dollar? I think it is. Yeah, uh, last time I checked, uh, Camus, uh, like I say, I'm not here to sell books, but uh, if yeah. you're interested, but, I mean, um, uh, certainly, you know, you might encourage your library to get a copy. Uh, um, I don't know if they can, you know, they can probably purchase ebooks these days. They have ways of controlling the. Um, yeah. um, uh, I, I would paste in the, um, the link, but I'd have to um, fiddle around to find the. Uh, um, the site, but uh